Hey everybody, I am on a little bit early, um, but I would like to um, talk to you guys tonight about the R. Kelly situation. Um, the docu-series was interesting because um, as a kid born in the late 70s um, and like growing up in the 80s and 90s, I can remember his music so vividly and I remember um, absolutely adoring his music. But I have to think back as an adult, um, I was enjoying his music when I was probably about 12, 13 years old. And it's crazy because um, a lot of parents, because it was marketed as R&B, um, a lot of us felt, a lot of parents, I believe back then, felt like it was appropriate because it was R&B. And you know, it's it's like R&B and that's the music that um, my mom listened to. That's the music that my aunts and uncles listened to. And so when R. Kelly came on the scene, um, it, it, it didn't seem inappropriate um, for me to be listening to it. But if I think back to um, the music and I think back to 12th Place specifically, which was my absolute favorite CD when I was in the eighth grade, um, geez, that was, that was some heavy stuff. Um, and so it kind of starts to make you think now I'm a parent um, and my youngest is 15 and my other heartbeats, um, they're 20, 19 and 18. And so as a parent, I'm sitting here thinking how inappropriate certain music is, but because it's packaged a certain way, um, we listen to it, you know, and, and, and our children end up listening to it. But the docu-series, let me tell you why the docu-series um, really got to me. It didn't really get to me. Um, because of R. Kelly and what he um, has done. What really got me thinking was how our children are unprotected, right? So we have this thing of exposure, right? You know, we think about um, how old is too old and how young is too young to expose our children to certain things, right? There are some parents, they're the helicopter parents. Their children aren't exposed to anything. And so when they get to be a certain age, they get sent out into the world um, and they are just way too naive, way too naive. They don't, they don't know anything about um, their social cues are completely off because their parents have, you know, sheltered them and haven't allowed them to be exposed to certain things. But then there are their parents who expose their children to way too much, right? There's way, way too much exposure um, for certain children. And so as a parent, we have to think about what's too little and what's too much, right? You know, is this too much? Is this too much? Is this too little? You know, we really have to think about that as a parent because exposure is important. If you want your daughters and your sons, right? Because I do have a son. I'm at four heartbeats, three girls and one boy. But if you want your children to understand the social cues, um, they have to be exposed to certain things, right? Um, I'm a therapist. Um, for those who are joining me live and don't know, I'm a therapist by trade. Um, and I get a lot of teenage clients who their parents have kept them in a bubble, right? They don't want them to know about sex. They don't want them to know about drugs, alcohol, anything, right? And I think a lot of times as a parent, when we don't want to expose our children to anything, it's because we don't know how to handle the situation. Um, if they become curious, um, if they um, show interest in wanting to try it and wanting to do certain things. So as a parent, you know, they will put their kids in this little bitty bubble, right? Because you don't want to expose them to anything. And then there, there are parents who I get some clients who they've been exposed to way too much. They know too much. They've seen too much. They've heard too much. And so my friend, um, Shavana Gaylor, she's also a therapist. She said, you know, even as a therapist, we struggle as parents and we do. My oldest heartbeat is 20. And, you know, um, we really didn't know what we were doing. We were just kind of feeling out the way and trying to figure out, you know, how much to expose her to. And so as the other girls came along, um, I kind of got, you know, a little better at what to expose them to and what to not expose them to. But then you have to realize that even when we don't expose them to too much or too little, they play sports. They're part of, you know, the band. They're part of Color Guard. They're part of a club and so their exposure gets bigger and bigger and bigger even if we don't want 
to expose them to things. And so that kind of leads me to my second point of safe spaces, right? So, you know, one of the ways to make sure that you are exposing your child at the appropriate ages, um, especially when you think about them going into junior high and high school, um, your 12 year old is now on campus with a 14 year old or maybe a soon to be 15 year old if they've been held back. And so your innocent 12, 11 or 12 year old um, needs to be exposed to certain things, right? They need to know um, what's going on. Um, for everybody who's joined me, hi, hi. There's so many of you guys on here. Um, I can't exactly say hi to everyone, but thank you for being a part of um, this live. But let me go back to safe spaces. I did a talk for um, Upland School District a few months back, and I talked about creating safe spaces for our children, right? Because when your kids enter junior high and high school, the exposure is there. Whether you want to expose them to it, whether you think it's too much, too little, the exposure is there. And so in order to create a safe space, a safe space is um, basically the opportunity in the space for children and young adults to be able to express um, curiosity, for them to be able to express how they feel, for them to be able to express um, the things that are going on in their head that they feel like they have to keep to themselves. Because a lot of us wonder how R. Kelly and, and adults like him, and we're not just talking about men, women do the same things that R. Kelly has done. Um, when we talk about how he was able to pull these kids in, um, a lot of times it's because those safe spaces were not created by parents and the community. And so there was one particular family who talked about how they had talked to their daughter about, you know, all these different things, um, you know, and to keeping her safe. But the thing is, is that it can't just be the family. It has to be the community. We have to create safe spaces, teachers, ministry, um, group leaders, uh, community agencies, these things have to be safe spaces that are available to kids to be able to express anything and everything. Because this is the thing, if, if, if they're not comfortable expressing it in a safe space with a, a mature adult, there's going to be someone who manipulates that and creates a pseudo safe space for our children to ask questions, for our children to experiment, for our children to um, be exposed to things that, you know, they may not be mature enough to be exposed to. So, you know, the second question is, as adults, are we creating these safe spaces for our children? And if you say you are, I would love for someone to comment on this live and tell me what kind of safe spaces do you feel that you're creating, not only for your children, but for the children in our community? Like what types of safe spaces, um, you know, for teachers, you know, um, teachers spend what 60% of the time with our kids, our kids go to school from seven to two or eight to three. And so that safe space has to be created in the classroom. It has to be created, um, on the, on the playgrounds. It has to be created in the locker rooms. Like these safe spaces are important. And so as a parent, um, one of the ways that I try to create a safe space is I share a lot of my own mistakes with my children. Um, and as they become age appropriate, um, I share things that they are shocked that I would share with my own struggles um, as, a, as a youth. Um, because one of the ways for me to get them to understand that I truly know where they're coming from is to share my own mistakes, right? And again, I say age appropriate, right? So now that my son is 15, I've shared with him with the fact that me and his father dated in high school. So use your imagination. We were 100% totally in love in high school. So that meant that we found ourselves being in adult situations that we had no business being in. And so we had to make some adult decisions, right? We had to make some adult decisions um, <laughs> that we should not have ever had to make because although my mother was very upfront and open, she didn't necessarily create a safe space for me. Um, and I would love to say that she did because I love my mother and she was absolutely wonderful, but she did not create a safe space for me to be able to ask questions as a 15 year old young woman with a, with an ongoing steady boyfriend who we were just inseparable and totally enmeshed. And so I found myself having to make decisions. And so I've shared all my mistakes as a youth with 
all of my heart beats. And even their friends, if their friends ask me questions, you know, I don't mean to step on parents' toes, but if a youth is coming to me and asking me questions, whether it's in a professional setting or a personal setting, I, I, I feel, I feel like it's my duty to share with them my mistakes because, and, and so that they can understand that even if they don't feel comfortable going to their parents, they are, they, they're more than welcome to come to me. And I'm never gonna steer them wrong. I'm never gonna say, hey, I did this, so you should go out and do it. But what I am trying to get them to understand is that I am a safe space. And so as adults, as a community, we have to be the safe space, not only for our children, but for the children in the community. A lot of parents will come to me and say, oh, my kids tell me everything. And then the kids come in the office and tell me stuff that they've never shared with their parents. And I know that this is the same for my kids. So that means that, I have to make sure that I'm putting people around my children that they feel comfortable going to, right? Because that's a part of creating a safe space as well. Making sure that you're putting people around your children that if your children don't feel like coming to you, they can go to them, right? So I'm talking... Um, some of the people that I purposely placed in my children's lives is Miss Carolyn Tillman, um, Janice Bush, and Tonya Bush, um, uh, Tamika Casey, Pastor Sam Casey, Will Greer, Tanya Greer, um, Leslie Westbrook, Terrence Westbrook. These are the people that I have purposely placed around my children to make sure that if they can't come to me or their father, or they can't go to their grandparents, or they can't go to, um, you know, I have bonus children, so they can't go to their other parents, um, that they have other adults in this community that they can go to the buffongs um i i can't name everybody off the top of my head but my village i have made sure that my village um is is readily available for my children um and that's something we have to remember with these safe spaces right we have to be the safe space and we have to create the safe space right my third point is honesty <sighs> So this 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 is tied into me being honest with my children. A podium wash. <laughs> okay, I could feel that. Um, you know, when I share my mistakes with my children, um, when they are at the age where they can really understand and they're kind of struggling with the same things, um, you know, honesty is the best thing we can be with our kids. If we're not going to be honest with them, if we're going to give them these uh, these these pseudo. Uh, you know, scenarios, like every single scenario when we want to teach our children has to be a real scenario because if we're going to teach, right, we have to be honest. One of the things that I love about my pastor, um, I call him my big brother, Sam, but Pastor Samuel Casey is that he is 100% honest. And I love that. I feel like that's the only way that I can connect with him um, as my spiritual leader is for him to be honest about his own fears, honest about his own mistakes, honest about the things that that he continues to struggle with, even as a man of God and even as a even as a servant who has a true heart of servitude. Like that is something that we have to remember with our kids. We have to remember that honesty is is the only way to teach them. Because the thing is, again, like I said in the beginning of this live, like R. Kelly is not the issue. Because there are a million R. Kellys and there are a million women just like R. Kelly. The issue is that our children are unprotected. And one of the ways that they're unprotected is that we don't expose them to much, you know, because we want to keep them safe in the bubble. We don't create the safe spaces and we're not honest with our children. Right. So let, let me let me ask you guys a question. When you were young. OK, and I'm going to I'm going to be transparent with this. When you were young, weren't you flattered by adult attention? Let's not forget. I went to Altaloma High School and um, there was a lot of grown women and grown men coming there to see and pick up and hang out with children. And it was flattering. I remember when I was 13 years old. So I was getting ready to go to the eighth grade and there was this boy in the neighborhood. He didn't tell anybody really how old he was, but we knew he wasn't in high school. And because I had been raped by my stepbrother, um, I was extremely vulnerable um, and very susceptible to male attention. And I hungered for it. And so come to find out, this, this, this guy, he just, just constantly, constantly kept at me. Now, I was very petite. I wasn't like bada bada type of body when I was growing up. But I was, I was very well-developed 
in the chest area, little bitty waist, and had a little bit of a booty. Um, but I was very mature um, in a lot of the ways that I presented myself. Now, I'm not saying that I was necessarily a mature woman, but I could I could play the mature game if I needed to because I had older cousins um, that I would hang around. And so um, come to find out he was 19 years old when I met him. And I was 100% smitten with his attention. Why? Because um, my biological father was not a part of my life the way that he should have been. And I know that um, a lot of times when I say that, you know, I have family members who don't like to, who don't like me to share the truth. But the truth is, is that I craved my father's attention. 100% craved it. And because my daddy didn't make me a daddy's little girl, I 100% loved male attention. So my mom gets with Aaron, who um, I refer to as my dad, but um, he had sons. And so I found myself, and I'm going to go back to the 19-year-old the that, that I started dealing with. Um, but he had sons. And because he had sons, I just wanted brothers, right? But because my mom didn't create the safe space to necessarily always have these conversations with me. Um, I allowed for my stepbrother to be totally inappropriate with me, right? Which led to him pushing the envelope of um, what a brother-sister relationship should look like, which led to him raping me. So now I've been raped by someone who I trusted and loved. My biological father is not the father that I need. Um, my stepdad was great. And when I say that he was great, meaning that um, he came into my life and he was a good provider and he was a good supporter. But again, he didn't create the safe space. We, we didn't sit down and have conversations about inappropriate, appropriate brother, sister relationships. Because remember, I'm an only child. So I'm not, I wasn't clear on what is and isn't appropriate because I had cousins, but I didn't have any brothers living in the home with me. So here comes this 19 year old boy. I'm 13. I'm a little developed. Um, and you know, he checking for me and all the girls in the neighborhood wanted this boy to check for them. And he checked for me. He chose me and I felt special. I felt, um, like one in a million. I felt like he was the be all to end all. And I had sex with him. I did. Why? Because I'd already been raped. So my virginity wasn't an issue because I no longer valued myself. And he gave me something that nobody else gave me. He showed me the type of attention that nobody else was showing me. And it didn't even dawn on me that my relationship with him was inappropriate until eighth grade started and he showed up to my middle school to hang out with me. And one of my friends pulled me aside and was like, yo, 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 this ain't right, Wendy. This ain't right. And I was like, why? But he likes me. And why does it matter that he's 19? Because at that time, I had now turned 14. Um, what does it matter that, you know, he's 19? It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. And they was like, yo, dude, he's raping you. And I was like, whoa. And for me, that word registered because my stepbrother had raped me. And so I never imagined that this relationship that I was engaging in was rape. That I was being preyed on by a grown man. Right. And it took me six months to end that. Right. All the sneaking, all the lying. Um, it took me six months to end that relationship that started when I was 13 and lasted until I was turned 14. And then he turned 20. Right. And so, you know, we wonder why our children become involved with adults because the attention is flattering, but the attention is flattering when the safe spaces haven't been created. The attention is flattering when, um, conversations haven't happened. Um, you know, the attention is flattering when, um, fathers aren't protecting their daughters, when mothers aren't protecting their sons, these situations happen. 
And so as mad as we want to be at R. Kelly, as mad as we want to point the finger at R. Kelly, and, and, and please understand, I'm not saying that R. Kelly was right. I'm not saying that anything R. Kelly did was right. But what I'm saying is, as much as we want to point the finger at him, what about the parents? What about the community? What about the fact that when we notice that these children are starting to become withdrawn? What about when we notice that our girls and boys are showing signs of um, neglect, right? If any child is being raised in a single parent home, there's neglect. Y'all got that? There is neglect. It didn't matter. My mother was a great mother, but there was neglect. Not on her part, but on my father's part. If you are raising a child on your own, there is neglect. Bottom line, neglect. I was neglected. And so I was prime picking to be raped. I was prime picking to engage in a sexual relationship at 13 with a 19 year old man because I was neglected, because I wasn't protected by my father. So we want to point the finger at R. Kelly, right? But in my situation, the real finger belongs to my father. He abandoned me. He neglected me. It doesn't matter that him and my mother didn't work out. It didn't matter. I should have always been the priority. And because I wasn't the priority, I was left wide open. And then it gets worse, right? Because even though it dawned on me and I got out of that situation, when I got to high school, um, I still craved male attention, even though I had a boyfriend who was great, who ended up being the father of my son and I married my high school sweetheart. He was great, but that, that attention, and remember, I still had a stepfather, but I was still so hurt and broken on the inside that, uh, that older male attention still fascinated me, right? And so I know I'm not the only woman who has this story, and I know that there's other men who have this story. I have a very good friend, and because it's not my story, I won't share the name, but I will share um, part of the story. Um, this young man, well, this man was 17 at the time and this 27 year old woman was engaged in a sexual relationship with him. And one of the things is that because when she was young, grown men were engaging in a sexual relationship with her. And so she just repeated the cycle, right? The cycle continues. And so again, as mad as we want to be at R. Kelly for what he did, Right? When you are a victim, you are more likely to become a predator. Right? And that's the truth. You are more likely to become a predator when you're a victim. And so how do we, as a community, make sure the victims don't become the predators? I went into therapy. But how many people are willing to go into therapy? If you've been neglected, if you've been abandoned, if you're a product of sexual abuse, if you're a product of rape, if you've been abused, if you've been raped, if you've been sexually assaulted, if you've been molested, how many people actually go into therapy to work on those issues? How many of us carry those issues into our adult lives? And so now when we have our own children, we don't want to expose them to too little, too much. We don't create safe spaces. Because we haven't healed. So we talk about healing and protecting our children. And one of the ways, you know, for us to heal and protect our children is to heal ourselves. Because I don't think that I would have ever been able to be a competent clinician and a compassionate clinician and a person who creates safe spaces for my children and for other people's children if I had not gone to therapy myself. Right? Are are there any questions? Um, Would anybody like to type a question? Uh, Thank you, Vicky. 
Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes you just got to be transparent and you just got to share your story. Thank, thank you for your kind words. Are there any questions? I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Um, I, I'm always open to dialoguing. So if there's any questions um, that you guys might have, um, please feel free to type them. I will answer them. Um, so let, let, let me kind of recap. When we talk about protecting our children, right, we have to make sure that we are exposing them to things at an appropriate age, right? Because you can't have a 15-year-old young woman or young man who has never had conversations about sex, alcohol, inappropriate behaviors, boundaries, and barriers. Barriers are things that are non-negotiable. Um, boundaries are things that are flexible. Like these conversations have to happen, right? So we have to talk about exposure with our children, right? Um, and safe spaces, making sure that you are a safe space, making sure that you are putting people in your children's lives um, that they can be vulnerable and honest with, making sure that you are being honest with your children um, about the things and the mistakes that you have made, um, and then making sure that you take the time to heal your own heart and to heal your own hurt so that A, you don't become a predator, and B, you don't become, um, you don't continue to become a victim because I was victimized several times until I decided to get hurt. Vicky, your question is, what's my advice to young girls that may see this video if it's shared? Um, my advice to young girls and young boys, because I do have a son, um, and like I said, you know, this happens to our boys just as much as our girls. My advice would be, um, especially if you find yourself being flattered by attention from a woman or a man that's older than you, ask yourself why. Why are you flattered? Because it didn't dawn on me that I shouldn't have been flattered until somebody brought it to my attention. So if you find that you are a young woman or a young boy and you are flattered by an older person's attention, ask yourself why. And if you're flattered, if, you, if your answer is um, because no one else shows you attention, ask yourself why you need that type of attention from someone older than you. If you find that um, it's because you don't have a good relationship with your mother or your father, um, and you just crave male or female attention from someone older, then you need to start looking at how you can either um, repair that relationship with your parent or reach out to go get counseling. This is something that I will say. Um, you do not have to get permission to get counseling if you are 13 years or older. If, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if your parents are anti-counseling, you do not have to get permission to seek therapy. You don't. Um, Phil, your question is, what do I say about hiding that um, hurt of your past by putting the mask on as an adult? You know, there are one of the reasons that a lot of marriages don't work. One of the reasons that a lot of relationships don't move into marriage is because people put up a mask, right? They hide their hurt. They hide their pain. But one of the reasons that we hide our hurt and our pain is because we don't want to face it. And having to face it means having to remove ourselves from situations, remove ourselves from relationships, and re-examine how we move in certain spaces. So I think that's one of the reasons um, why people hide their hurt and they put on a mask. Are there any more questions? Any more? Well, I will say this. Um, please share this video. Please, please, please share this video. If there's any young boys or girls who happen to see this video and you are seeking guidance and assistance, I will type my um, contact information in this thread, but also you can reach me at 909-576-5431 or you can also reach me at truthhealingevolution at gmail.com. I appreciate you guys for being on this live with me. Um, you know, I hadn't planned on doing this. I am kind of on my sabbatical, but this was something that was just kind of stirring in my soul, um, that I felt like I needed to share. Um, and I needed to be transparent because I think a lot of times, you know, um, people think as a therapist, you know, 
you know, everything for me is about what I've studied. And a lot of, a lot of what I do as a clinician um, is I utilize myself as a tool because I want to let my clients know that they're not alone in what they're going through. So you guys, as always, I appreciate you. I appreciate my village. I, I appreciate my community. Blessing you guys and good night.